trying it all the ways up and it's not working. I had that trouble when I put up them kitchen units for Mrs. Colon, said the sergeant. The instructions on how to open the box were inside the box. Uh-oh, it's worked it out, said the rat catcher. Looks like it had it mixed up with its knees after all. Colon heard a clank below him. And now it's gone round the corner. There was a crash of splintering wood. And now it's got into the building. I expect it'll come up the stairs. But it looks like you'll be OK. Why? Cos all you got to do is let go of the roof, see? I'll drop to my death. Right. Nice, clean way to go. None of that arms and legs being ripped off stuff first. I want her to buy a farm, moaned Colon. Could be, said Arthur. He looked over the roof again. Or, he said, as if this were hardly a better option, you could try to grab the drain pipe. Colon looked sideways. There was a pipe a few feet away. If he swung his body and really made an effort, he might just miss it by inches and plunge to his death. Does it look safe? he said. Compared with what, mister? Colon tried to swing his legs like a pendulum. Every muscle in his arm screamed at him. He knew he was overweight. He'd always meant to take exercise one day. He just hadn't been aware that it was going to be today. I reckon I can hear it walking up the stairs, said wee mad Arthur. Colon tried to swing faster. What are you going to do? He said. Oh, don't you worry about me, said wee mad Arthur. I'll be fine. I'll jump. Jump? Sure, I'll be safe. You will fight to see. You think that you're the normal size? Wee mad Arthur looked at Colon's hand. By my boots, he said. It's not your fault you moved into a suit full of giants. Right, the smaller you are, the lighter you fall. Well done, in fact. A spider will not even notice a drop like this. A mouse would walk away, a horse would break every bone in his body, and an elephant would splat. Oh, God! muttered Cole. He could feel the drain pipe in his boot now. But getting a grip would mean that there would have to be one long, bottomless mouse. When he was not exactly holding on to the ground, not exactly holding on to the great and his very serious peril of holding on to the ground. There was another crash from somewhere on the roof. Right, said we mad Arthur. See is at the bottom. Oh god! The nose stepped off the roof. All okay so far? Shouted as he went past Oh god! Sergeant Conan looked up into the two red clothes. Doing fine up to now, said a doctor ring voice from below. Oh god! stood on fresh air for a moment, grabbed the top of the pipe, ducked his head as a popper of fist swung at him, heard the nasty little noise as the pipe's rusty bolt said goodbye to the wall, and still clinging to a tilting length of cast iron pipe, as if it were going to help, disappeared backwards into the floor. Mr. Sutton looked up at the sound of the door opening, and then cowered back against the sausage machine. You, he whispered, here, you can't come back, I told you. Dawson regarded him steadily for a few seconds and then walked past him and took the largest of the blood stain ran on the morning. Sock began to say, I, I was always good to you, he said. Always let you have your holy days off. Dawson stared at him again. It's only red light, Sock chilled to himself, but it seemed more focused. He felt it entering his head through his own eyes and examining his soul. The golem pushed him aside and stepped out of the slaughterhouse, towards the cattle pen. Sock unfroze. He got his foot back. He couldn't. He was out of the way of the main. He stared around at the other workers, humans and trolls alike. Don't just stand up! Get it! One or two hesitated. It was a big squeeze with the golem's hand. And when Norton stopped to look around at them, there was something different about the golem's stance, too. It didn't look like something that would fight back. But Sock didn't employ people to come up with the Tonight, no one had really liked a golem around the place. A troll aimed a poleaxe at him. Dorfel caught it one-handed without turning his head and snapped the hickory hand across the wall. The man with a hammer had it plucked from his hand and thrown so hard at the wall that it left a hole. After that, they followed at a cautious distance. Dorfel took no further notice of it. The steam over the cattle pens mingled with the fog. Hundreds of dark eyes watched Dorfel curiously as he walked between the fences. They were always quiet when the golem was around. He stopped by one of the largest men. There were voices from behind. Don't tell me it's going to slaughter the lot of them. We'll never get that much joined in this year. I heard it was one of the carpenters that went on and made five thousand tables at one night. Look out for something. Because you're staring at them. Five thousand tables. One of them had twenty-seven legs. It got stuck on legs. Dorfel brought the cleaver down the path and sliced the lock off the hip. The cattle watched the golem with that guarded expression which cattle have that means they 
waiting for the next door to turn. He walks up the calmly back down the line of pens, ignoring the watchers, and re-entered the slaughterhouse. He came out very shortly afterwards, leading the ancient and hairy billy goat on a piece of string. He went past the waiting animals until he reached the wide gates that led onto the main road, which he opened. Then he let the goat loose. The animal sniffed the air and rolled its slotted eyes, then, apparently deciding that the distant odour of the cabbage fields beyond the city wall was much preferable to the smells immediately around it, it trotted away up the road. The animals followed it in a rush, but with hardly any other noise than the rustle of movement and the sounds of their hooves. They streamed around the stationary figure of Dorful, who stood and watched them go. A chicken, bewildered by the stampede, landed on the wall of and started to climb. Anger finally overcame Sock's terror. What the hell are you doing? He shouted to a field of a few stray sheep. That's funny. Sir, said Carrot cheerfully. What about plodding? Or that plodding either, Carrot added quickly. I've always pointed out to people that you walk in a very purposeful and meaningful manner. Vimes gave him a sharp look and saw nothing more than a keen and innocently helpful expression. Don't look at the light, because the light is what we look with, said Vimes. Okay, and now I think we should go and have a look at the candy factory. You come, little bottle, and bring it in. Have you got taller, little bottle? Detritus should have come off duty from the palace. When it comes to locked doors, you can't beat Detritus. He's a walking crowbar. We'll pick him up on the way. He knows he's his crossbow. He doesn't know. Right, he said. We've done it the modern way. Now let's try to him like Brad Farley. It's time to... Crossbow! Said Carrot hurriedly. Close to Vimes taking a deep drag and blowing out a switch. But no cigar. Sergeant Colonel's view of the world has been changed. Just when something was about to fix itself firmly in his mind, as the worst moment of his entire life, it was probably replaced by something he discussed. Firstly, the main fight was in the middle of the opposite. They were well organized. The fight was landed on a fire escape. The fire escapes were unknown in Art Mordor, but the flames generally had to leave fire the roof. The fight thus leaned against the wall. He found himself sliding down a diagonal. Uncertainly, they get nervous, and the street was already, as it were, paved with anxiety. The only benefit to Sergeant Colton was that this was slightly softer than the other was in the case. Hooves trod on his hands. Very large, drizzly noses sneezed at him. Sergeant Colton had not hitherto had a great deal of experience. 
lot of animals, except the Tried to get up, skidded on some cow at the moment of crisis, and sat down on a sheep. It went blah. What kind of noise was that? A sheep. I got up again and tried to get away. Shoot! Get out of the damn way, you sheep! God! The beast hissed at him and stuck out and gave too much neck. Over and backed off and stopped. And stopped, and stopped, and stopped. No, Mr. Dreadful, this wasn't the little piggy that went to market, or the little piggy that stayed at home. It would be quite hard to what kind of foot would have a piggy like this. But it would probably be the kind that also had hair and scales and toenails like cashew nuts. This piggy was the size of a pony. This piggy had tusks, and it wasn't pink. It was a blue-black colour and covered with sharp hair. But it did have, let's be fair, thought Colin, little red piggy eyes. This little piggy looked like the little piggy that killed the boar hounds, disemboweled the horse, and ate the hunt. Colin turned around and came face to face with a full light of the horse in his mouth, dropped an onion down his trousers, covered him in oatmeal, and dropped him in the upper. Angular's shoulders started to shake, even Vines grinned. And then it went into the country merchants, grabbed Mr. Thurby, and... Man stopped aware of the lady breath, even if she was making snorting noises while trying not to laugh. And continued his mumble. We may use your fish to an onion, if you know what I mean. You may need to Sid's only an apprentice and didn't deserve what it done to him. 
Carrot, why don't you scop? My gods, what the hell is that? There was a fellow further up the street. Something big and bloody approaching a torch menacing out. In the group, it looked vaguely like a very fat centaur. Half man, half... In fact, it was, he realized, as it sounds clearer. Half cola, half cola. Some cola was on his head. suggested he had been cut to the soil. As the massive bull carried Sergeant rolled his eyes wildly and said, Hey Dad, get off! Hey Dad, get off! How did you get on? shouted Mike. It wasn't easy, sir. I just grabbed the arm, sir. Next minute I was on a back. Well, hang on. Rogers had reasoned that there must be two bulls. Bulls not having been bred from 